Molly Gray and I'm the co-chair of the International Law Society here at Vermont Law School. And it's my pleasure to introduce the second and perhaps most anticipated panel of the day entitled, Are You on the List? The Legal Implications of Targeted Killing. This panel is meant to address the legality of the U.S. policy of targeted killing under international humanitarian law, also known as the law of war or law of armed conflict human rights law, and also U.S. constitutional law. Moderating the panel today is Vermont Law School professor and international legal scholar Pamela Stevens. Professor Stevens teaches international law, international human rights, international criminal law, genocide, and civil procedure here at Vermont Law School. <laughs> Her recent scholarship focuses on the intersection of international human rights and international criminal law. Prior to joining the VLS faculty, she clerked for the Honorable John W. Peck on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and was an associate at Graydon, Head, and Richardy in Cincinnati, Ohio. She has also been a visiting professor at the University of Oregon, the University of Cincinnati, and the University of Trento in Trento, Italy. She has studied at the Center for Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where she was a fellow in the summer of 2008. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stevens and our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to keep my remarks pretty brief. I'm going to introduce the whole panel, I think, uh, very briefly again, so we have a maximum amount of time to hear from them and uh, for our discussion. Um, as, as Molly's already said, this panel uh, is uh, one that is certainly topical. It's, uh, almost impossible to pick up a newspaper or access one online these days without coming across coming across a story that deals with this issue of targeted killing, perhaps uh, most recently perhaps in the context of targeted killing of Americans by drones. Um, so uh, this is a this is a, I hope going to be a, a, a very interesting panel. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, with us uh, people who have panel, a distinguished panel, uh, people who have approached this issue from many different perspectives, so I'm hoping it will be a very lively panel uh, and that your questions and discussion afterwards will uh, contribute to that. So um, the, 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 the first thing I want to mention in terms of process is everyone's going to have about 10 to 12 moments to speak. Um, I will try to keep them on a tight rein here so that we do have time for uh, discussion afterwards. Um, and as I said, I'm going to I'm going to introduce people in order. We're going to start with uh, Professor Professor Turner. I'm just going to introduce people in order of the way in which they're sitting, so that it will help you perhaps keep keep track. Uh, the full bios for these people I understand are online, so that if you would like uh, to read more about our panelists, you can do that. So I'm going to give you very bare bones uh, about them, uh, and it will not do justice to all of the many things that they have done uh, and written about and thought about. Um, our first uh, panelist, uh, farthest to my right, uh, is uh, Doug Bandow. Uh, Doug's a senior fellow <laughs> at the Cato Institute. Uh, he specializes in foreign policy and civil liberties. Uh, he worked as a special assistant to President Reagan uh, and was editor of the political magazine Inquiry. Uh, he writes regularly for leading <coughs> magazines such as Fortune, National Interest, Wall Street Journal, Washington Times, uh, and has been a regular commentator on a multitude of uh, media uh, television stations, and he holds a JD from uh, Stanford uh, University. To my immediate right uh, is uh, Professor Robert Turner, uh, who is a professor at the University of Virginia uh, School of Law. Um, he uh, has his both his his uh, his uh, degrees from the University of Virginia School of Law, both his uh, professional and academic doctorates from the uh, University of Virginia School of Law. He's a co-founder of the Center for National Security Law with Professor John Norton Moore uh, and has served as its associate director since then, uh, except for a couple of periods of time in which he worked in government. Uh, he has also occupied the, John, oh, excuse me, the Charles H. Stockton Chair of International Law at the U.S. Naval College uh, in Newport. Uh, he is also a veteran of two army tours in uh, Vietnam and served as a research associate public affairs, affairs fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution on War. Excuse my stumbling speech. Um, uh, as I said, Professor Turner is going to start our, our panel off, I think, on a, an interesting note. <laughs> <laughs> to my immediate left uh, is, is Chris Jenks. 
uh, who is a, uh, a, the director of the Criminal Justice Clinic and Assistant Professor of Law uh, at uh, SMU Dedman School of Law in uh, Texas. Um, he has his bachelor's degree from West Point uh, and his JD from the University of Arizona College of Law. He uh, has two LLM degrees and is currently a PhD candidate uh, from at the Melbourne University School of Law. You like those law degrees? <laughs> uh, he is, he is immediately after graduation from law school, Professor Jenks was uh, the, assigned as the primary international law advisor to the U.S. Army uh, Infantry Division, uh, which had more than 15,000 soldiers serving near the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. During that uh, assignment, he defended the status of forces agreement, uh, rights of American soldiers during the Korean interrogations and trials in high-profile and politically sensitive criminal cases uh, that were brought. He has served as a senior criminal prosecutor in Washington, D.C. Uh, he has also uh, was deployed in 2004 to Mosul, Iraq, and served as a chief legal advisor uh, to uh, the commanders and staff of more than 4,000 soldiers in the brigade combat uh, team. So again, uh, bringing a, a wealth of experience uh, uh, to this, both legal and, and practical to this topic. Uh, Gabor Rona, who is also to my left, uh, is the International Director of Human Rights First, uh, which he joined in uh, 2005, is that correct? Yes. Um, he is, as the, as the director, he advises Human Rights First programs on questions of international law, coordinates international human rights litigation, represents Human Rights First with governments, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, the media and the public on matters of international human rights and international humanitarian law. Before. Before coming to uh, Human Rights First, he was the legal advisor in the legal division of the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, in Geneva, focusing on the application of international humanitarian and human rights law in the context of counterterrorism policies uh, and uh, practices. And he also holds the distinction of being a Vermont Law School graduate. <laughs> and finally, um, you've, already, you've already been introduced to uh, Professor Lewis. Uh, and uh, he is, he is as, as you heard in the first panel, a professor at, uh, at Ohio Northern University uh, in uh, Ada, Ohio. Uh, he, he, is, he has been on the faculty of, of uh, Ohio Northern since uh, August of 2006. He also has a military background, as you heard, uh, flew F-14s for the US, United States Navy in Operation Desert Shield. Uh, he is a graduate of the Harvard uh, Law School. Uh, and, uh, and has published widely uh, on various aspects of the law of war and the conflict between the U.S. and Al-Qaeda. So welcome to all of our panelists and Professor Turner. Got a call earlier from Marco Rubio. He said, take the water up with you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Delighted to be here and trying to set my timer on a slick piece of plastic on a sliding table is not a smart idea. I do have the list of uh, those of you that are on the list. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk later on that. I have an awful lot of material to cover. I apologize for that. The slides will be available on the appropriate website. Uh, if you're not on the list, I'll tell you what that is later. Uh, if you want to see them, I probably won't make it through them. Basically, it seems to me there are two. There are two issues here. One, are we in war? That is to say, are we engaged in an armed conflict in which the law of armed conflict uh, prevails, or is this law enforcement? Is the, the idea of a war on terror or a war against Al Qaeda really like the war on poverty? Uh, and second, uh, uh, you know, sorry, and if that's the case, then obviously killing people without judicial process is murder, assassination, what have you, and it doesn't matter whether you use a sniper a nuclear bomb or a predator drone. Uh, the second issue, is it lawful to kill Americans inside or outside this country without judicial sanction? Obviously it's not in most cases, but are there cases where the president can order the killing of American citizens? I'm going to argue the answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, and I think we're in one of those, those situations. Now are we in a war? Well, who decides that? I don't think it much matters. Uh, the UN Security Council, NATO, on the international level, have both said we're involved in armed conflict. 
The United States Congress, the President, both Presidents, and the Supreme Court have agreed. Uh, and on the other side, you've got the ACLU and some other very nice NGOs, but last time I looked, they didn't, they didn't count in the final vote. The Security Council has passed several resolutions uh, referring to the inherent right of individual and collective self-defense following the 911 attacks. That's the language of international armed conflict. It comes from Article 51, which recognizes the rights of states to individual and collective self-defense in the case of an armed attack. Uh, again, Resolution 1373, same thing. Uh, NATO, the day after the 911 attacks, for the first time in its history, invoked Article 5, which is the armed attack language that talks about acting collectively in a military map. Again, a little armed conflict. The U.S. Congress passed the AUMF, authorizing the President to use appropriate force against those organizations, nations, and persons he determines were, are tied to Al-Qaeda or other groups, took part in the attacks and so forth, uh, in order to prevent future attacks. The combined vote in Congress was 518 to 1. Uh, it formally implemented the War Powers Resolution for anyone who thinks this was just sort of a, you know, maybe someday we ought to do something. And I would suggest it satisfies any due process of law requirements that might exist in armed conflict when American citizens have joined the enemy. After all, we did have a process of law by which Congress said, these individuals may be killed. Uh, now, both presidents, President uh, Bush on September 20th, 2001, President Obama, January 7th, 2010, said we are at war. And the Supreme Court in hand be hand dead and various other opinions has said, yes, we are engaged in an armed conflict and the law of war applies. Uh, so on one side, you've got the people that count, on the other side, you've got some very interesting organizations. I'll let you be Now, most killings in wartime are extrajudicial. We don't send lawyers and judges out in the battlefield and say, hold your fire, Private, before you shoot that soldier, uh, we need to have a hearing here and, and see some uh, beyond reasonable uh, proof of uh, starting off with what he was born and a little background on his parents. You, you lose wars that way. Uh, it's not assassination. This is an issue very de dear to my heart. I've been involved in it since the early days. Back in 1990, I wrote what became the lead story in the Washington Post Outlook section, arguing that Saddam Hussein was a lawful target. A few months later, I was having had a lunch in Washington, and the head of the CIA, Bill Webster, came up and said, Bob, if we could have found him, we'd have taken him out in an instant. They just couldn't locate him. It is now, there's been U.S. policy since then. I don't claim full credit. But I am told my article got a lot of people thinking about it. I wrote the article because Dick Cheney had just fired the chief of staff of the Air Force for saying if we had to use force to remove Iraqi troops from Kuwait, uh, we, would, we would kill Saddam. And Cheney said, we don't do assassination. And my argument was, hey, that's not assassination. In, a, in an armed conflict, you can use necessary and proportional force, and nothing in international law protects the head tyrant, the head aggressor, uh, from being targeted. It's much preferable to go after the head wrongdoer than to kill tens of thousands of relatively innocent Iraqi kids who serve in their army or in their military. Uh, various definitions of assassination. The common element, murder. Murder by lying in wait, murder by treachery. Uh, the murder of a political or religious figure. And I apologize, I just realized I made a poor window here. Uh, some of you can't see that from this side. Maybe I can, I want people to hear me if I step down, but. Uh, Oh, yeah. I, some people are wondering. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Take, take. Anyway, uh, I won't go into a lot of this, but the key, the key element to assassination is murder. It was my job right after Executive Order 12333 was signed by President Reagan. I was the uh, counsel to the President's Intelligence Oversight Board, and literally I was the senior White House person charged with interpreting that order. And my, my judgment at the time, and it has not changed, is that assassination does not, it, it has to involve the element of murder. It has to be an unprivileged killing uh, to qualify as assassination. Uh, but, you know, more on that later. Lawful acts of self-defense, lawful acts in an armed conflict are not assassination uh, because they're not murder. Uh, during the American Revolution, we intentionally targeted British officers and their guides. It upset them greatly. It was a clever move. <laughs> 1943, we intentionally shot down an airplane carrying Admiral Yamamoto, the mastermind behind Pearl Harbor. It was not an assassination, even though we sent out a bunch of planes 
for the sole purpose of finding his aircraft and splashing it was not assassination, it was killing an enemy during wartime. Uh, uh, you know, there is a belligerent privilege in wartime. You are allowed to kill the enemy. Uh, this is well established uh, by the law of conflict. You don't need the approval of a judge or a jury. Bin Laden, terrorists like him, are they, are they a lawful target? The answer is yes. If they're engaged in a series of ongoing armed attacks against the United States, if peaceful remedies have been exhausted or clearly won't work, uh, if we don't otherwise violate international law, like by using poison gas or something like that, that is a weapon, they are lawful targets. I did a piece in 1998 in USA Today, which they entitled, In Self-Defense, USA's Right to Kill Bin Laden. That was before most Americans had ever heard of Bin Laden. Uh, we had the opportunity more than once, we didn't take it, and you know the consequences. What about being a US citizen? Well, in reality, uh, a guy named Abe Lincoln killed about 94,000 U.S. citizens, at least he considered them U.S. citizens, in something called the Civil War. Uh, uh, obviously, when U.S. citizens are within the United States or in settings where we could apprehend them without great risk of loss to our own personnel and so forth, we ought to do that and, and try them. Nobody, nobody disagrees with it. There's been a lot of silliness in Congress about, oh, Obama wants to kill his political opponents. This is simply not true. It's one of those, you know, what if things. Does the president have the power to order the Air Force to shoot down an Air France jet by telling the military, shoot this down, it's got all the top terrorists in the world on it? Of course he has that power. And he might well be able to kill them. That would not be a lawful act, and he would be impeached and probably then tried as a criminal if it turned out he did it just because the Republican leaders of the Senate were on that plane or something. <laughs> this, you know, the president has all kinds of powers that can be abused, but there's no suggestion here that those powers are or are going to be abused. People say, why not let Alawaki surrender? He knew he was on the list. It was front page news in the New York Times. Uh, he had father hired lawyers, or got free lawyers from the ACLU. I actually had the pleasure of debating them at, at Columbia University right after that case started. All he had to do was go to the American consulate and say, hey, I'd rather come back and have a fair trial. So we didn't let him come back and have a fair trial. We were gonna shoot him on sight. But the, the, the government of Yemen was willing to let us take him out with a drone, but not willing to let us send a bunch of American military forces to invade their country and grab it. That was not politically acceptable, quite reasonably. Uh, what about citizenship? Okay, the, the Supreme Court in the Quirin case, citizenship of the, in the U.S. of an enemy belligerent does not relieve him from the consequences of a belligerency. One of those is if you're a belligerent, you can be killed. Citizens who associate themselves with the military arm of the enemy are belligerents within the meaning of the Hague Convention. Uh, again, if you're a belligerent, you're a lawful target, unless you're forced to come by, you're in a hospital, there are some settings where you cannot be targeted, but uh, they're, they're generally your lawful target. Corrin was cited with authority uh, by both the majority and minority in some of the most important Supreme Court cases since 9 one uh, lethal force can be used to protect human life in self-defense, uh, defense of others, and also as a military matter. Why do we have SWAT teams in most of our major police departments and an FBI hostage rescue team if you need a judicial order before you can shoot somebody? This is silliness. You get in a setting where somebody's taken hostages and said, I'm gonna kill one every five minutes till I get my money. You tell about the hostage, the hostage rescue team, get him in your crosshairs, take him out. No judicial process, not a crime, not assassination. Uh, all right, let's see. Suppose one of the 911 hijackers had been an American citizen. Would that mean the president could not order the shooting down of the plane that was flying into the South Tower? Uh, thanks, sorry. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, Battlefields. Oh, you can only kill people on the battlefield. That's all thinking. Yeah, it was once the case that we would mass on opposite sides of a big field and charge together. That's not modern warfare. Uh, where was the battlefield in the struggle against Al Qaeda? 1996, it was in Saudi Arabia when they blew up the Kobar Towers. In August of 1998, it was in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, U.S. coal was attacked in Yemen. That was a battlefield. <coughs> in 2001, it was in New York City. And the idea that if it had not just been suicide bombers, but there'd been people on the ground planning to blow things up, you think our people wouldn't have been able to shoot them on site if they identified them? 
even before they pulled out their detonators or started dialing the phones on their cell phones, of course they could. Uh, I won't go through this. Yeah, you're the, you're the National Security Council legal advisor. You're told Flight 175 is about to hit the South Tower, but there are 50 American citizens on board. So obviously, you, you can't shoot it down. I mean, you know, uh, American citizens, you need a, a court order. Uh, so what do you do? You tell the president you can't do it, do you try to get through to the ACLU, you try to get in the docket to see a judge, full time runs out and you have 911 all over again. Where's the battlefield? It's where you find the enemy. This is nothing new. During World War II, we declared war against Germany. When Germany sent uh, Rommel into North Africa, we sent Patton in to take care of him. We did not declare war against the countries of North Africa. And we also did not declare war against occupied France. We sent American troops in there to kill the enemy. International law allows killing the enemy anywhere you can find them, with very few exceptions, like hospitals. Uh, and that includes sleeping in tents at night. They don't have to be aiming rifles at you. It's not self-defense, it's war. Uh, and it's not limited to just shooting riflemen. You can also shoot cooks and bus drivers and so forth. Medical personnel and a few others are protected, but generally, the enemy uh, is, is a fair game. Predators, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just because of time, my clock has stopped, so I'm very <coughs> over or not. One minute, perfect, okay. Basically, there are big advantages to predators. First of all, they can loiter over an area for hours, listening to everything that's said and watching. There can be 100 different people in 50 different cities watching the monitor. Turns out the third guy over in the crowd sitting on top of the building is a deep cover CIA agent. The CIA guy says, hold your fire. Saves a very important asset. Turns out there are a bunch of small children all of a sudden walking by the building. Hold your fire. Wait till the kids get by. Lots of advantages. Legally speaking, it doesn't matter whether you're using a sniper rifle, a predator drone, a cruise missile, any weapon system. You cannot use it to deliver poison gas, you know, chemicals, biological agents. You can't use it to attack civilians. Uh, or other protected people. Beyond that, generally, uh, the, the legal issue doesn't change. But in reality, uh, if you use predator drones, you're likely to have less collateral damage and be more accurate and make fewer mistakes because you can stay there and, and watch. Some of us like the idea that our operators are not placed at risk. Uh, now, if, if we're upset about using Hellfire missiles to kill foreign terrorists, uh, where's all the outrage over the Apache helicopters? Each of them can carry 16 Hellfire missiles, same missile that the Predator drone carries. Uh, there's just a lot of silliness here. We're at war. It's lawful to kill the enemy. We, need, we ought to be killing the enemy so they won't be killing our people. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly there are some difficult issues on the borderline, but the basic issue is, yes, it is lawful to kill Americans, even in this country, if they're part of the enemy and it is no reasonable option for apprehending and, uh, and trying them. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a, a, a very important topic. The question of uh, use of targeting killings, and particularly the question of American citizens, though in fact the vast majority of people who are targeted are not American citizens. One looks at drone use around the world, it's primarily people from other countries. <laughs> you know, we can see the politics of it with the, uh, the recent filibuster in Congress, obviously a lot of legal and constitutional issues. And certainly the administration recognizes the importance of this issue. Last month, Press Secretary Jay Carney was asked about the controversy, especially the issue of could the president kill American citizens. Press Secretary responded that the president takes his responsibility as commander in chief to protect the United States and its citizens very seriously. He takes the absolute necessity to conduct our war against Al-Qaeda and its affiliates in a way that's consistent with the Constitution and our laws very uh, seriously. And that, I think, is the tension. The question of how do you protect the United States and its citizens and how do you do so in a way that's consistent with the Constitution and the law. And that's what's raised by the uh, targeted killings. And of course, targeted killings can be any way. I mean, we're thinking these days about drones, but it can be you send in the SEAL team and you take out whether it's Osama bin Laden or it's somebody else. One could imagine other techniques of, of targeting people and killing them. You know, it raises very important foreign policy issues. I mean, are they effective? What, how, what is their usefulness? Do they create a backlash? It's going to be particularly important, I think, looking in the years ahead as other countries get drones. 
you know, what happens if China has a full use of drones and they start whacking people, we may suddenly have a different view here. It's certainly worthwhile to think about international rules on this as we look to a world where, in fact, the United States may no longer have an effective monopoly on the use of drones. So a lot of important foreign policy considerations which are beyond our panel, but ones which policymakers in Washington certainly have to be cognizant of. And then, of course, very important legal issues. The legal issues that are kind of heightened of the question of American killing of American citizens, but that's not the only issue there. We certainly have a constitution and a political structure that comes out of a, a suspicion of executive power. You know, there's certainly you know, the king was not supposed to issue death warrants. This was a controversy back in the 1300s. And basically he said, you can't do that. <laughs> you, know, you just can't go out there and decide you want to whack folks. You look at the, kind of the, the, the legal tradition of Coke, Blackstone, and others carried into the American context, a very real sensitivity to the notion of what executive power is. <coughs> Nevertheless, everyone also understands that at war, the president has commander-in-chief responsibilities and the question of how do you protect your country if you're at war. Again, there's a tension there of how much authority you want to give <coughs> to the government as opposed to the duties that you're going to impose, the responsibilities you're imposing on the very same officials. The uh, you know, case was filed in the Alawaki case. The court uh, basically stepped back for procedural reasons. So we've seen this kind of in sharp focus. And the question is, how do you have a level of accountability? It's not just constitutional legal issues. It's also important, I think, in a broader sense of being a democratic republic. One of the challenges of drones, and one has to ask this, can go either way. Does the use of drones, for example, raise or lower the threshold of war? The estimate is, uh, they, uh, you know, Senator Lindsey Graham has used the number 4,700 people who have been killed through drones. That's a fair number of folks. So if we're viewing that as real war, have we lowered the threshold of war? Or by using drones, have we actually made it less likely that we have to invade other countries, whether it be Pakistan or Yemen or somewhere else? These are important considerations. And the question about kind of war in the shadows, especially where drones controlled by the CIA, I think now we're looking at a question of should all of that be moved over to the Pentagon, where in fact you're putting it where in sense you know, the question of war belongs. Are we kind of losing some of the public debate that we might have in terms of presidential war making through the use of drones and targeted killings? I think it's a, it's a very tough issue. You know, traditional combat was pretty easy. I mean, nobody doubted that you could fly over Berlin during World War II, and if you killed Goebbels and Goering and all that, you know, the Nazi cabal, you could do it. Nobody's going to spend a lot of time worrying about it. If there's an American citizen working at the propaganda ministry, you know, making broadcasts, and they died in the bombing raid. Nobody was going to cry about it. Nobody was going to say you had a judicial warrant. You know, there's a clarity there. Kind of battlefields provided that clarity. And certainly, as Professor Turner indicated, you, you didn't have to be an actual combatant. I mean, if you were a cook or if you were a supplier, you were doing logistics, you're a legitimate target in war. But, of course, the war on terrorism, or however you want to characterize it, is much more complicated in terms of what it is. We don't have quite the same clarity. That, uh, you know, at, at some, some points it kind of looks more like crime, at other points it looks more like war. What's the battlefield? Is the battlefield everywhere? Is it everywhere that any person is who might want to harm America? Is it the United States itself? And I think that, you know, one can get overly energized about the president dropping drones in America. I don't really think the, the President Obama is sitting there plotting to do this. But, you know, if your homeland is the battlefield as well, it raises questions about the role of the Constitution, the kind of legal limits. You know, who are the combatants? Is there a difference between being a combatant and a propagandist? Can you kind of be affiliated with an organization and just chatter away and demand death for Americans but never do plotting? Are you a target or not? You know, what happens if the American citizen gets involved in some way or another? You know, these, I think, complicate the issue and make it harder for us to figure out what to do. And it's one where courts are not very good at trying to decide that, even if the district court had wanted to get to the substance of the Alan Walkie mm. case. I think the administration made a reasonably good case in terms of Alawaki as to why he was targeted, why it was appropriate to target him in terms of the organization he was with and the threat that it posed. Of course, they really didn't want to deal with the public. They didn't want to release the 50-page memo that they did. It's kind, of, it kind of a trust us. And I think that is a real question that we have to ask. Are we prepared to do that as the wars move more into the shadows, or do we have to kind of have more explicit rationale and more explicit at least accountability for some of these things? I think the question first is legal justification. And I think there are several levels one could look at that. One is the Constitution itself in terms of defense of the United States being commander in chief. You know, what do you do if the U.S. is under attack? That was, the founders certainly wanted Congress to declare war, but they also recognized that the president as commander in chief had immediate duty in terms of attacks on the United States. 
Congress could have a declaration of war. They could also act and have legal authority it's kind of less than that. They used it during the quasi-war with France. I think the authorization to use military force is the same kind of a thing. It's an authorization of military force. It's legislative. One could argue maybe they should have done a declaration of war, but to my mind, critically here is you had the legislators in the United States sitting together, and you had political accountability. You have somebody who's voted. People can vote on them. And the, uh, and the kind of a tension with that, then, you, especially with the question of a, a, uh, an American citizen of the constitutional protections, to what extent do those get involved in this? You know, in terms of a constitution sets authority for the U.S. government, you know, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, due process. I mean, a lot of things that can come into that. Also, the question of international law, certainly the general role of international law is you bar arbitrary killing or deprivation of life of people. All of these deserve to be taken seriously. Uh, and I think one of the dangers is, again, the sense that these kind of wars can, uh, can uh, be in shadows. It's all trust us. We're relying on intelligence. We can't tell you what the intelligence is. We're we can make decisions on who fits the category, where they're at, how much we can do, what level of force we can do. And the nervousness there is a question of the, you know, there's a tendency, I think, to expand that and allow more. And that may be very dangerous, both kind of your own constitutional processes as well as foreign policy objectives. I think the problem today we're facing is that while the authorization to use military force, I think, was very effective when it came to Al-Qaeda, the challenge today is that we're really moving beyond that. That is, I mean, the guys at Al-Qaeda who, I mean, I'm very happy we've been whacking them, we've done very well taking out the leadership of Al-Qaeda, the folks who plotted 9-11. The question then is, how much further can you go? And at what point does the, do you kind of lose the, the authority there? The AM, uh, AUMF talks about using all necessary and appropriate force against those who planned, authorized, committed, or aided the attacks. Well, is that really true of the folks who are active now in Yemen, or in Pakistan, or potentially Mali, or kind of fill in the blank of where we might find these folks? I think we're, this is, I think, a real challenge for us legally. It's a question of groups. You know, I mean, to what, what does it mean to be an affiliate? To what does it mean to be associated with? If you look at the administration of the Justice Department memo, they talk about being associated with or affiliates. What does that mean? Does that legally bring you within the authorization or not? Uh, you know, what happens if you're dealing with entirely new groups that have a different set of grievances? I mean, they don't care about whatever bin Laden talked about. They're mad because we went to war in Iraq or something else. So they're a new group. They've started up. They have the same objectives but they are different. I think there we have to worry a little bit about whether that, in fact, is an appropriate legal authorization. Maybe we can fall back on the Constitution, but it's much stronger to have, a, uh, I think, a legal authorization from Congress. In terms of international law, the administration points to this. The administration says you have to have a level of imminence, and the challenge, of course, the imminence is what does that mean in this context? It's very, you know, we have, I think, a sense of imminence of law enforcement, you know, their hostages are there. That's why we have the SWAT team. We know it's there, they're threatening to kill them. Well, unfortunately, terrorists don't afford us that. You know, they're out there, they're secretive, they attack episodically, their job is to kind of hide among civilians. <laughs> well, I think the administration made a reasonable case that you can argue imminence if you join a group that is, actually has, as its objective, violent attacks on Americans. We don't have to prove there's an attack right there, but you have to at least, you know, have some evidence that this is a group that plans these sorts of attacks has this as an objective, is capable of doing so. At some point in there, I think you satisfy imminence. The Justice Department paper also pointed to necessity, it pointed to proportionality, pointed to humanity, the question of civilian casualties. So all of these things, I think, get wrapped into you know, the question. And I think all of them are very important. And what worries me, I think, is that what we see today is we are losing, I think, the statutory authorization. Because I think we're moving to these new groups. We, we haven't filled that in. And the constitutional authority there for commander in chief is very important, but we're getting now, it just suddenly becomes administrative action. You know, if you read the, uh, the New York Times article in terms of targeting, I mean, the president sits around with 100 of his closest to, you know, personnel, and they look at video screens, and they kind of just, it's almost like the Roman emperor, you know, it's up or down. And I don't doubt the president's goodwill on this. But I get nervous when I read a news, a, you know, a, an article in the a newspaper talking about how you know he's read Augustine, he's read Aquinas, and he's that. Whoa! I mean, you know, is this this how you make judgments in terms of who gets killed or not? Again, what's the question of accountability? What are the standards here? Uh, you know, what does it mean to be imminent? What does it mean to be last resort? 
you know, it's, I, I can certainly believe that it's impossible to capture these people. We prefer to have them captured. My guess is that if this was happening, uh, you know, in Europe, what we do is we go to the German authorities and say, could you please capture these folks? <laughs> not quite so easy to go to, you know, northwest Pakistan. It's not clear the Pakistanis would do it. It's not clear they could do it even if they wanted to do it. Clearly, we're seeing around the world very different circumstances that I think makes an argument for this kind of warfare. What I would suggest is what we want to do is have a more regularization here. Now, we could imagine different techniques, one of which would be some kind of a process modeled after the FISA court to have a judicial review or kind of special judges trained in this or intelligence or military. One could imagine an administrative process within the executive branch of non-political appointees where names would be brought to them as well as intelligence to make judgments. We need at least some sort of, a, I think, a sense of accountability that somebody can look at back at these, again, I found the New York Times article disturbing, particularly on the issue of signature attacks. And that's, I think, in many ways raises the biggest question. Signature attacks, we don't even have a name. We simply look and say, you're carrying weapons in a certain area, you're hanging out with people we think are terrorists, you're driving around a fertilizer in your truck, we think you're a terrorist. Well, that gets very dangerous. I mean, we can, you know, there's, the Wall Street Journal has written that most of the uh, attacks in Pakistan are signature attacks. I don't know if that's the case or not. But these raise the greatest questions in terms of civilian casualties and the greatest danger of hitting the wrong people and creating backlash against the United States. If you target a particular name, I think it's far better than simply saying we're gonna to try to take out behaviors in areas where these behaviors may not be unique to combatants. So I think it'd be nice, we need to have a process to try to regularize this where Congress should be involved in setting some standards, criteria, perhaps setting the administration list criteria for organizations to be designated as you know, combatants and sunset it over the years so it doesn't go perpetually, but say every 10 years this has to be revisited. This is an area where I do believe that the president has the authority and in this kind of warfare in today's world is necessary, but we should look to a greater constitutionalization and legalization of it and congressional involvement to set better standards and ensure accountability. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. I want to begin by thanking Vermont Law School uh, and the organizers for this extremely well organized uh, and exciting, uh, exciting conversation that we'll be having throughout the day. Um, in the interest of candor, uh, although it's perhaps impolite to begin by insulting your host, I want to let the Vermont Law students know that I know that Tuesday was a snow day. <laughs> and that you have disappointed me. Uh, it's a snow day in Vermont. Uh, although I've, I've, learned, I've learned from some of you that I should, we should all be grateful for the snow, as if otherwise it would be mud season. Which I did not realize was a season until I arrived <laughs> yesterday in Vermont. Um, I'd like to take maybe a step I'm not sure if it's back or laterally from, uh, from my colleagues on the discussion. Uh, I want to talk about unmanned aerial systems or what is generally referred to as drones. Uh, I'd like to talk about maybe how we could, and I would submit should, refine that discussion and really refine, refine the, uh, the disagreement. And I say unmanned aerial systems and then make a reference to drones. I just, I note at the outset, and I'll, I'll clarify this a little bit later, you know, in some, uh, in, in, in the movie, In It's a Wonderful Life, you hear that uh, every time you hear a bell ring, uh, an angel has gotten its wings. Every time the word drone is used, somewhere a United States Air Force officer flinches. Uh, because it is, a, it, is an imprecise, it is an imprecise term, and there's some problematic aspects to that lack of precision and how that uh, plays into the vernacular, how it plays into our discussion. Um, I think we all know that at some point this week, there was an article in the New York Times that talked about a drone strike. It was in Afghanistan, it was in Pakistan, and I'd, I'd like to ask rhetorically, although you can follow this up in your questions, what you thought when you read about the drone strike. A certain number of militants, suspected militants were probably killed, a certain number of possible civilians were probably also killed, and, and what you thought about that. Uh, I submit maybe some of you thought that that was illegal. Uh, my question, or my first question, would be, kind of following up on Professor Turner, what if it hadn't been a drone strike? What if it had been a cruise missile or some other modality of force that inflicted the same casualties? I submit that most people 
if I asked you, well, are you okay with the strike now? I mean, I think most people would say no. Uh, and my point is, so the objection really isn't on the modality of force, the, the drone that's firing a Predator missile or the Apache that's firing, frankly, the same missile. The concern is more broad. It's a use ad bellum. It's a use of force more broadly. Uh, I object to the fact that we are using force and taking lives in Pakistan, in Yemen. The modality of that force, I don't think, is often the relevant uh, criteria. I think the issues, so I think the legal issues associated with drone strikes are not, frankly, specific to the drones themselves. They're at a higher level, this use at bellum, or uh, how and why we use, use force. Uh, I do think there have been some potentially problematic precedents set, and it's only a matter of time before uh, the U.S. has the opportunity to see what it feels about those precedents when they come back uh, are used by other countries. I was struck, as many of you may have seen, uh, in the last month that China uh, reported that they had uh, contemplated using drones to attack uh, in Myanmar. That there had been, there was an organized armed group that had purportedly come into China, had killed, uh, horrifically killed and even videotaped the killing of a dozen Chinese soldiers, and that the uh, Chinese have contemplated uh, a drone strike in, in Myanmar. Uh, they ended up uh, taking those individuals into custody, but if you were to play that fact pattern out in, say, individuals were suspected of coming from Pakistan, killed 12 U.S. service members in Afghanistan, and then went back into Pakistan, I don't think the U.S. would have any reservations about a drone strike into Pakistan against uh, those individuals. And I wonder, though, if people's reaction would be the same if you just change those facts to, uh, to China and Myanmar. Um, I also like positing to students about a Mexican drone strike. Uh, Mexico arguing that the U.S. is unwilling or unable to stop the flow of weapons uh, south into Mexico, that thousands and thousands of Mexicans have died in the narco wars that have resulted, and so Mexico launches a surgical drone strike into my new home state of Texas. Uh, I think many would have problems with that, and yet I think in some ways there is a logical consistency in that argument to that which is being used uh, by the U.S. in Afghanistan. So to the extent that they're not, strictly speaking, legal issues, I think many of the concerns about uh, drones are more moral or ethical. Uh, I think that's perfectly appropriate and legitimate concerns to have, but I don't think those concerns are frankly new. Uh, Professor Turner talked about the fact that we've targeted, we have targeted by name individuals in conflicts throughout, uh, throughout our history. The remoteness of the strike, the remoteness of the strike is also nothing frankly, uh, frankly new. So I, I, challenge, I challenge everyone to try to think through what the concern or the objections to drone strikes. Uh, to my way of thinking, that, the argument manifests itself with an assessment on the legality of an individual strike. So the strike that happened this week, whether you think it is legal or illegal. Um, that overt manifestation is actually very misleading. Uh, certainly, if one side thinks that it's legal and other side thinks it's illegal, that's not agreement, but that's the, frankly, I think, the least of our problems. That is the part of the iceberg that is above the waterline. Uh, and then there's the whole enormous part of the iceberg that is below the waterline. And the problem is that the one side in getting to legal, the other side getting to illegal, are applying wholesale different frameworks of the law. They're applying the human rights paradigm. They're applying the law of armed conflict. So in essence, the fact that there is a yes, no disagreement at the end of the question is in a sense the least of our trouble. We're not even asking the same question or applying the same law in how we answer uh, the question. One of the problems I see with what I think is the fixation on drones or unmanned aerial systems is that it takes up, it takes up most if not all the air in the room. And it's a fixation that is preventing us from moving on to, I think, more problematic areas and areas more worthy of our discussion. And this ties back into, we need to stop referring to drones as drones and come up with perhaps a, a shorter version of unmanned aerial systems. And I say that because what, whatever your concerns, moral, legal, or ethical, about drones as such, I submit they pale in comparison to that which 
you will have on autonomous systems. So whatever one thinks of the predator, or the drone that is launching a missile uh, somewhere around the world, that drone is doing so at the behest of a U.S. Air Force officer, probably, who is piloting it remotely from Creech Air Force Base. So again, not that there aren't problems with that, but that is a human being controlling a weapon system. Autonomous systems don't have a human being that is deciding when to use uh, lethal force. And I think many people in the country would be surprised to learn autonomous systems are not some future issue. Uh, autonomous systems have been in the U.S. military for over two decades. I think many would be surprised to know that defensive autonomous systems in the U.S. military have claimed lives. In each of the Gulf Wars, the U.S. employed Patriot missile batteries that autonomously conducted, you know, search the skies trying to identify threat aircraft. In each of the Gulf Wars, those missile batteries misidentified what it thought was an Iraqi threat, but was in one instance an F-14 Tomcat, and in another instance a British Tornado, and the Patriot battery itself launched the missile. Without even being pushing a red button, a human being could have stopped the launch, so you have this distinction of man on the loop versus in the loop. But the Patriot missile battery, running the threat program it had been developed for, launched the missile, which incorrectly targeted and killed a Brit and an American pilot. So we have these autonomous systems that frankly have been out there for two decades, and I think we're on the cusp of incorporating them decreasingly more uh, in an arsenal. And I think they raise considerably more legal, moral, and ethical issues than those that are extant with a piloted or a piloted system. And so I would suggest we try to shift our discussion and our conversation to some of those systems. Thank you. about and the things that I, I vehemently disagree with some of our fellow panelists about. I think it shows that America right now is still very committed to the alternatives to doing things right. Um, the question of is it, is it war that Professor Turner brought up and he cited um, as evidence for the, for the proposition that of course it's war, um, that the Security Council authorized the use of force, that the United States Congress has an authorization for the use of military force. Well, um, these are references to aspects of international law with which I am simply unfamiliar. There's human rights law, there's the law of armed conflict. These bodies of law tell you when you can use force in international relations. They tell you when you have and don't have an armed conflict and it has nothing to do with the declaration of any individual or body. It has to do with facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground for the establishment of the existence of armed conflict are relatively knowable. They are that first you have to have parties. And the parties have to be sufficiently identifiable through a command structure so that the laws, the responsibilities, and the rights that fall within the law of armed conflict can be executed. And if you don't have identifiable parties, and if you don't have a modicum of hostilities, a threshold of hostilities that brings you above and beyond the normal application of law enforcement norms, such as you know, occasional acts of violence or riots here and there, if you don't go above those thresholds, then you simply do not have an armed conflict. And it doesn't matter what the Security Council says. It doesn't matter what Congress says. It may matter as a matter of domestic law, but it doesn't establish the fact of armed, armed conflict um, under international law. When was the last time you heard of a country declaring war? It just doesn't happen anymore. These things are irrelevant. Also, Professor Turner's initial statement that, well, if it's not war, it's assassination. Um, well, I'd have to say that's, uh, that's not correct. That's not correct because we have these legal bodies of both humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, 
and law enforcement as we understand through the application of international human rights law as well. And even if you don't have an armed conflict, obviously there are circumstances in which states are not, um, are not prohibited, are entitled to use force in their international relations. And the UN Charter that Professor Turner pointed us to tells us exactly that, that a state can use armed force either in self-defense or when authorized by the Security Council without regard to the question of whether or not there exists an armed conflict. So the concept of what constitutes war that he framed and the idea that, well, if it isn't war, you can't people kill people and we obviously have to be killing these people, so it has to be war, is also, I think, simply incorrect. Let me get to drones, um, which is kind of exhibit two in, in this discussion, which I, I kind of call drones, drones, drones. I agree with many of my uh, fellow panelists that um, while they do present some unique challenges to traditional concepts of applicable law, um, and I'll touch on those shortly, drones are not the message. They are the messenger, like a submarine or an airplane that launches a missile, um, like a helicopter with gunships, and like boots on the ground that conduct targeted killings. Exhibit three, drone attacks on American citizens. Uh, again, I agree to, with what seems to be the, uh, the prevailing view on the panel. It's true, Americans are a minuscule percentage of people killed by drones. People killed by drones are a minuscule percentage of those affected by drones. You try living in, a, in, in, in an environment in which a drone is buzzing and hovering overhead 24 hours a day and you have to be fearful of your children being killed as collateral damage anytime and all the time. And the people killed and otherwise affected by drones are still just a small minority of those killed or otherwise affected by targeted killing generally. Another item, drones att drone attacks on US soil, Give me a break. Droning Americans and droning a Starbucks in Des Moines, Iowa, you know, it might capture the Ameri American imagination and it might be a catalyst for some useful conversation, but we're not having that useful conversation as long as we're just concentrating on whether or not there's gonna be a drone attack on a Starbucks in Des Moines, Iowa. And the consequence of that is that the rest of the world gets thrown under the bus and the consequence of throwing the rest of the world under the bus is that it's gonna come back to bite us in the butt. On the other end of the ledger, there are some who categorically reject the concept of targeted killing, not just drone attacks, but targeted killing generally. So here's a reality check on that. In the real world, and especially in the real world of war, the alternative to targeted killing isn't peace, it's indiscriminate killing. Because, as fellow panelists have said, killing happens in war and it happens legally within some respects. There are significant limitations to killing in war, but killing is legal in war. So you don't get rid of killing by getting rid of targeted killing. The alternative is simply a war crime, indiscriminate killing. So let's not do that. In general, I think as a nation, we've hardly begun to address the, the issues that are really presented by targeted killing. And some of those have been asked here, but, but I think not answered. What is war? What are the temporal limits of war? What are the geographic limits? Um, who can be targeted? Concepts of imminence of harm. Membership of the enemy. The idea that I think, again, Professor Turner proposed, well, you're a member, then you're targetable. It's always been that way. No, I don't think that's correct. If you're a member of the armed forces of Germany and the US is at war against Germany, yes, fine. But what does it mean to be a member of Al-Qaeda? I haven't seen membership cards. I haven't seen any evidence that women and children who are in an Al-Qaeda training camp because their husbands are in an Al-Qaeda training camp are participating in hostilities. <laughs> You might call them members because of where they happen to be. But to translate the concept of targetability from the Second World War, where you've got Army A lined up against Army B, into a situation where you have non-state armed groups and amorphous um, goings in and out between 
hostilities, and you have people who are clearly civilians who may fall within our overly broad concept of membership in these groups is simply an invitation to war crimes. Now, one of the things that came up here was the, the question of the application of international law in, in the first place. We've had debates about whether or not international law should apply or even does apply. For example, in the debate about CIA targeted killing versus DOD targeted killing, it comes up, well, the DOD says, you know, they're bound by the laws of war, and we haven't heard the same from the CIA, we haven't heard from the CIA that, um, that they're bound by international law, so that's a, good, that's a good reason to shift targeted killing over to DOD. Excuse me, where is it said in international law that you get a pass from the obligations under the Geneva Conventions, under the application of, of international norms for killing, just because you are a member of an agency whose mandate is not to kill, as opposed to an agency whose mandate may be to kill. That simply makes no sense. The idea that international law is somehow not obligatory, and the idea that it is simply a value to be, to be placed on a scale of other values, simply is a rejection of the very concept of rule of law. Law is not a value to be placed on the scale. It is the scale upon which all values are weighed. And the most important reason why law does matter is because, again, as been said here, we're not the only kids on the playground. When other states, uh, when, you know, when will other states be able to employ this kind of technology? Well, the answer, I think, is about, well, five years ago. And when will non-state armed groups be able to do so? as soon as their bake sales and their drug deals enable them to raise enough money, which again is now. I want to quote John Brennan. The United States is establishing precedents that other nations may follow, and not all of them will be nations that share our interests or the premium we put on protecting human life, including innocent civilians. Now, as for the self-laudatory vision he has of American forbearance, let's get real. While he has steadfastly denied that we mis make mistakes or we countenance collateral damage, the overwhelming body of evidence is that there are large numbers of civilian, civilian casualties. And they come in two forms. The obvious one is unintended collateral damage. <coughs> but the less obvious one is people who are intentionally but wrongly targeted due either to bad intel or due to overbroad application of legal targeting authority. For example, propagandists, financiers, military age, age males who may find themselves in a strike zone, cooks, drivers. And you don't have to agree with Brennan about the premium we put on protecting life to know that he's right about the precedent thing. Now, I want to just make, I guess, one final point about the discussion we've had so far, we've touched upon in both panels, about the felt need for a new authorization for use of military force that would expand the scope of people who can be targeted. This is, I think, a bad idea, and it's made easy to swallow by prospects of drones as a magic bullet. It's easy on the pocketbook, it's easy on American casualty counts, but the question that has been posed here, how can we enrich the targeting environment, is exactly the wrong question. Shifting the burden of death from us to others is a classic tail wagging a dog issue. It's a classic, we have a hammer, therefore every problem is a nail issue. The proper question is, at what point do threats become so attenuated as to require a response other than extrajudicial killing? As at the moment, the US claims as a matter of policy to target only Al-Qaeda operational leaders, but yes, Lindsey Graham has said that we've killed 4,700 people by, people by drone accounts, and assuming even a high rate of collateral damage, these two statements are simply irreconcilable. There aren't 4,700 or even half that many Al-Qaeda operational leaders. One final point, and this is one I've hesitated to come, come to admit for quite some time, but I think the evidence has become strong that killing and detention are, in significant respects, a zero-sum game. The more you do of one, the less you can have of the other. Congress pretends to be tough on terrorism by creating obstacles to detention and prosecution, 
while the administration continue, uh, pretends to oppose and bemoan those limitations, but spends virtually no, limit, uh, no political capital on fighting those limitations. So I think we're a long way from getting any of it right. In fact, we're merely at the stage of asking the government to please tell us what its idea is of who it can kill in our name. That is, I think, the first thing to concentrate on to push down the road of getting the policies right. Thank you. Well, and I will pick up by trying to answer the very last question that, that Gabor posed, which is, who is it that we are allowed to kill or that the U.S. government is saying is allowed to kill in our name? And we, we have talked a lot about sort of the existence of the white paper, what is the standard, what, what are at least we now saying we are allowed to do. And, and for those of you who may not be familiar with it all, I think it's worth spending just a minute to remind ourselves that at least according to the white paper, according to the speeches by Coe and Brennan and Holder uh, at various times over the last few years, it's become evident that the U.S. is claiming that it has the right to use uh, lethal force under the laws of war against uh, operational members of Al-Qaeda. Operational member meaning not propagandists and not cooks and not financiers. Right? That's why this is different, Gabor's right, that this is different from German soldiers during a war in which you have a much broader, you know, you're a driver of a truck, therefore you can be killed because you're wearing a German uniform. Uh, that's not I kind of don't wear uniforms, and membership is not as clear. And what we've said is there is a subset of those members of Al-Qaeda. We are not killing based upon membership cards. We're killing based upon operational membership. That means you are engaged in planning execution of attacks of some kind. Are you planning IEDs? Are you making bombs? Are you directing others as to how to go about doing these things? Uh, then we've said that it has to be outside the United States. Capture must not be feasible. Obviously, feasible is a term we can have disagreements about, but uh, certainly in most cases it's pretty obvious that Yemen and Pakistan capture is extraordinarily difficult at best, if, if not impossible. And then there is the, the imminent threat issue. Uh, how imminent must the threat be in order for us to uh, go ahead and use lethal force. The one discussion that a couple of us here had last night over dinner was um, how, how does does this uh, sort of expand imminence beyond something that we recognize from our own laws or not? A lot of people have said that we are stretching imminence way beyond anything that's recognizable by saying you can kill al Laki not because he's on the phone kill, uh, ordering a strike right now, but because we know that he is a bad actor, he has been a bad actor in the past, and sometime in the future he may be a danger again, we have this window and we should be allowed to take it. That's essentially what Brennan was saying. Um, that's not that different from telling police officers that they may use lethal force against someone that has committed a violent crime and is uh, fleeing the scene. Right? I get to try to stop them leaving, but if I can't stop them getting away, I'm allowed to use lethal force. Not because they are a threat at this moment, not because they're about to kill somebody. This is not the sniper in a hostage situation. This is a unarmed murderer rapist leaving an area after having committed a murder rape, and you try to stop him. And you know that if he gets away, he is likely to be able to do this again. And so you have this window of opportunity. You attempt to capture. If capture isn't feasible, he's going to get away. You're allowed to use lethal force, even though he's not going to kill anybody right now. But you know that he could in the future. So this idea of eminence is not nearly as unrecognizable as perhaps some people uh, choose to say it is. The last thing about the standard is we have to comply with the laws of war. And Gabor was saying, well, what about the CIA? Is the CIA exempt from uh, complying with the laws of war? No. They aren't, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't believe themselves to be. The one thing that is for certain is that the CIA people that are flying drones have been trained in the laws of war and have been trained in the laws of war ever since October 2001. Uh, we had the director of the 
uh, drone program in the CIA at a conference a couple years ago in, at the University of Texas. And he said that right after this happened, when we began to say we are going to use armed drones, and the CIA is going to be part of it, we sent all of the people involved in that down to Charlottesville. They went through the armed conflict uh, training that other military people are required to take. Now, the other side of this that we don't know as much about is, is there accountability on the back end, right? The way you get to be an, uh, a member of an armed force and you get the combatant's privilege is one, you have to be trained in the laws of war, two, you have to be held, held accountable to them, right? The U.S. military has clear procedures for doing that. The CIA may or may not, we know less about that. If they do not have any accountability procedures, that is obviously a problem. Um, but, all, but we do know that they are at least trained in the laws of war. The other thing I want to say is, is that we are, I think, more concerned about drones than we are about other normal uses of force. Uh, Chris had said, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter whether it's boots on the ground, whether it's a cruise missile, whether it's a bomb from a manned aircraft or a drone. And from a legal perspective, that is absolutely correct but I think that we have much greater concerns about what are machines doing to men? And is this something that is sort of out of control or is it something that could become out of control? And so there's a, a, a much greater hesitancy about is there something wrong with drones doing this as opposed to people doing this? And this is historically how things have worked. As warfare has become more remote, and you go back to the Battle of Agincourt, right? And the French knights thought that the British archers were cowards and scoundrels and illegal because they were fighting from 500 yards away with their longboats, as opposed to coming in and fighting hand to hand, which is how war was generally conducted before then, right? And so, and every time you become more remote, you are thought to be taking advantage, you are thought to be breaking the law or at least breaking the norms. And this is true of now drones, right? It's somehow unfair that I can attack you without putting myself at any kind of risk at all. Because that's what drones do. I'm sitting at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. I'm firing a missile at somebody in Pakistan. I'm, I'm at no risk at all. And somehow that doesn't seem right or it doesn't seem fair. Uh, but I don't think that that ought to change how we uh, consider drones or whether we think drones are legal because ultimately drones are merely another platform and this I think moral tension is more brought on by hesitancy about the future, about autonomous weapon systems, about machines making these decisions. Uh, and that, I think Chris is absolutely right about, is what we need to be more concerned about, is when and where and how do we go down that road toward regulating or figuring out whether you can pass off the weapons employment decisions uh, to others further down the road. The last point I want to make is about drones are, are easy. Drones are easy, drones are a video game. Uh, you, you, you hear this all the time, as though it makes war easier to fight, and, and that's just not so. There are higher rates of PTSD among drone operators than there are among many combatants on the ground in Afghanistan. Drones are the most personalizing weapon that have ever been created in warfare. It doesn't seem that way because I'm 8,000 miles away from whom I'm killing, as opposed to a special forces guy who kills you with a knife, right? How, how could drones be more personalizing? They are more personalizing because before I kill you, I watch you for 72 hours. I've got to figure out whether you're my target. So I watch you go home to your wife and kids. I watch you play soccer with your son. I watch you kiss your wife. And then three days later, I follow you up a mountain road when you're driving in your vehicle, and I blow you up. And then I go and look at what I've done, because I have to assess whether I actually got the target or not, was it the right person. So I get a real close-up look at the person I just killed, and I know the person I just killed. No warrior has ever known as much about the people he is killing as our drone pilots know. This is not an easy way to fight a war. But it is a way to perhaps be more discriminating and more accurate, which is why it is a chosen method at this time in this kind of conflict. But don't let anybody tell you that this is easy. Thank you. Thank, thank you to all of our panelists at this point. I'd like to 
I've just been told we've been given a reprieve and we have extra time for questions as we are running up against our time limit here. Um, I first want to give the panel an opportunity to comment on each other, if you have comments you'd like to make um, with respect to what your fellow panelists said. One, I'm shocked at the amount of agreement. There are obviously some areas of disagreement, but I, I thought I was going to be a lone wolf here starting off and make you very mad and then be chewed on for the next uh, four talks. Uh, just two comments. Doug referred to setting up a FISA court type system to approve these attacks. Uh, that would be, we have a panel this afternoon that will be talking about, but that would be flagrantly unconstitutional. FISA itself is unconstitutional. I worked on it when it was passed in 1978. I worked in the Senate. Uh, I've testified on it at great length before the House Senate Judiciary Committees. If you're interested, send me an email. I'll give you some links. Uh, every court to consider the issue, to decide the issue, has held that the President has, under the Constitution, there, there is a Fourth Amendment exception to the warrant requirement for foreign intelligence surveillance. When we set up FISA, uh, the, the uh, Attorney General, Griffin Bell, told the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence that obviously this statute can't take away the independent power of the President. However, it's, we don't have to worry about that because Jimmy Carter is willing to go along with it. He likes the idea. Carter had that option, but he could not give away the presidential power of future Presidents. We set up an appellate court called the FISA Court of Review. It unanimously noted in 2002 that every court to decide the issue would help the President has this power. And they went on to say, we assume that's true, and if it is true, FISA could not take that power away. You cannot amend the Constitution by statute. So, uh, and when you move from, from that to, to war, when you've got the, the, the commander-in-chief power, Congress cannot pass laws telling the president, giving somebody else a veto over presidential decisions over the conduct of war. It's just not even close to being a constitutional act. Uh, second, Michael made the point that uh, this is like telling the police that, uh, hey, you've got a known bad guy, we, we know he committed two or three rapes and so forth, and right now he's going home to see his grandkids, but kill him if you can because he'll probably do something bad in the future. That is true in the law enforcement paradigm. In law enforcement, you can only use lethal force to stop an imminent threat to human life or serious bodily harm. In the law of armed conflict setting, which is what we're dealing with here, you don't have to wait until the infantryman on the other side picks up his rifle and actually aims it at somebody to kill him. You can literally, if he's asleep in a tent in the middle of the night, you can toss a frag grenade in the tent, and your only concern is getting away from that before the frags blow up and treat you like John Kerry did when he tossed a frag grenade and didn't think to duck and got a little bitty piece of fragment in his rear end that he later associated with another incident, got when he got his third Purple Heart, but that's also another story. But anyway, I'm delighted, I thought it was an excellent uh, presentation. I thought Michael's comment about uh, our distress to our pilots uh, of actually getting to know someone and then blowing them away it, it is a very perceptive and, and an accurate point. And I, I think uh, uh, Gabor made some excellent points. We obviously disagree on some things we can talk about if you want, but. Uh, I was, you know, I think it's as good a panel as I've seen on this issue. Yeah, very briefly, I, on Professor Rona's point, I think the reason to have a new authorization is not to expand the target list, but to regularize it. I worry that right now, we're, we're, by relying on essentially an outdated authorization, the administration feels pressure to declare anybody to be associated or affiliated, as opposed to trying to set some standards in terms of who really are potentially dangerous groups, as opposed to just anybody who claims some affinity for what Al-Qaeda might stand for, groups that might have absolutely no operational effectiveness. I'd like to have that regularized. I think there's an interesting question. Well, PS, you know, the, the drone operators may actually suffer psychological damage. Now, what I worry most about is the impact on policymakers. I do think that drones make it easier on policymakers to engage in war. And there, I think that's something we want to keep in mind as we think of policy tools. Is there a danger there? And to what extent do we try to make sure that policymakers take this as seriously as any other kind of war? I do like a system that reduces the, the danger to our own personnel. I will admit my nephew is a SEAL. He's prepared to go in and do killings if he has to. I'd much prefer that, that not, he not have to be used for that. And whether or not we set up an outside court or an inside court, I do think some system of accountability, even within an administration that's not dominated by political appointees, would be useful to provide accountability on these kinds of decisions, and certainly look back assessments in terms of how well they're doing, how well the intelligence is working, and what we're getting out of this. Um, 
two points, one on the, the so-called drone court idea. Uh, I think the important thing here is to distinguish uh, conceptually between an ex-ante process and an ex-post process. In an ex-post process, you have the application of international human, human, human rights law and humanitarian law norms, as well as domestic law, which essentially says that if you have been wronged, you have a right to a remedy. And there is no reason why existing judicial structures um, aren't sufficient and shouldn't be made available for individuals who feel that they have been wronged or their relatives have been wronged uh, by, a, by a use of force by an agent of the United States to come into a court to say so and to seek accountability and to seek remedies. Now that's quite different though from the concept of an ex-ante process where we would be asking something we call a court but remember, just putting black robes on people doesn't make them a court. And you put black robes on people and you ask them within the confines of our constitutional system to issue death warrants for individuals who have not been charged with any crime, who have not been convicted of any crime. That, I'm afraid, is, a, is asking our courts not only to do too much in terms of their own responsibilities, but in fact, if the individual is a combatant in an armed conflict, if the individual is directly participating in, uh, in hostilities in an armed conflict, if the individual is really an imminent threat as the term imminent is known and understood in international law, then it simply makes no sense to ask the executive to go to a court and get permission to do that. I would say it's probably a violation of separation of powers. So no to ex-ante courts, and yes, to the procedures that we've come to know for a long time uh, about seeking remedies and accountability in judicial process uh, post facto. One more comment just on, on the PTSD issue. Um, there, there should be no debate that, um, that killing people is stressful. But we're not talking here about whether or not the policy of targeted killings um, is legitimate or illegitimate on the basis of how much stress or it causes the individual that is pushing the buttons. What we're talking about and what we need to be talking about is the policy makers because they're the ones who are ultimately responsible for how the buttons get pushed. So I wouldn't spend too much time trying to equate um, the, the concept uh, of, of how difficult it can be for the drone operators um, with the question of whether or not the drone policy is either a good one or legal. Uh, two quick things. Uh, that there has been, been a number of people said this is going to come back to bite us. We, we are going, the policies we are using are going to result in terrorist drones coming after us, Chinese drones coming after us, etc. Um, certainly, everybody's going to have drones soon if they don't already. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, there, there's a practical reason why we don't have to worry about terror drones. There's a legal reason why I don't think we have to worry about Chinese drones. So let's start with terrorists. <coughs> drones require uh, support. Drones require a runway. If, if a drone is going to carry enough uh, payload to do damage, it's going to have to be large enough to get 50, 100, 200 pounds off the ground. Uh, it's going to need a runway and it's going to need maintenance people to fix it and keep it flying, and that is a fixed base. The last thing terrorists want is a fixed base, because after the drone completes its mission, wherever it lands, special forces will be right behind it, and they will clean up whatever is there. So there is no way that any terror organization, if they choose to make their money from their bake sales or whatever else, are going to use that to buy drones. It is far more accurate and easy for them to deliver the weapons they want to deliver with suicide vests and car bombs than it is with something as technologically difficult as a drone and one that is very much not in keeping with the terrorist objective to hide among the civilian populations. Now what about the legal side? What about the Chinese using drones in Myanmar or maybe in Iowa? Right? Is there a worry about the way we are conducting drone strikes now that says we're giving others uh, a right to do something we wouldn't want them to do? I think if the standard we are using is either permission 
right? Most of the strikes in, or all of the strikes in Yemen were done with permission. Uh, some of the strikes in Pakistan were done with permission. The other reason for the strikes in Pakistan would be the unable or unwilling standard. So you'd have to say, well, on the one hand, the Chinese can't use drones in Myanmar unless they get permission from, from the Myanmarese, uh, Burmese government, I use the old name. Uh, if, if they get permission, there's obviously no problem. If they don't get permission, then they have to have said, Myanmar is unable or unwilling to prevent this threat from Myanmar's territory to come after us. And if that is the evidence that they have, they go to Myanmar and they say, look, you need to do something about this. If you don't, then we are going to strike. And here is why we think that this is a threat and you need to do something about this if you can. Uh, and that kind of discussion is, is how this should be worked out. Same thing with Pakistan, right? They were clearly unable or unwilling to do something about bin Laden. So we didn't notify them and we went in and we did what we did uh, there. But that's the, if it's either the unable or unwilling standard or the permission, if those are the two bases for using drones, I don't see us creating a standard that we can't live with uh, in the future. Just a short rebuttal here. Two quick points on, on, on the Boris comment. I agree with almost entirely. But when he talks about allowing relatives of enemy soldiers that our soldiers have killed to bring suit in our courts, I can't think of anything more likely to it would just be devastating. First of all, our soldiers are not going to remember every time they pull the trigger. They're not going to have proof that person was in fact a lieutenant in the other army or something like that. They, and thus the message would be don't ever kill anyone. Uh, just they, they would file suits against our commanders just to get them out of the battleground, battlefield, and get them back waiting to appear in court. And it just, you know, read the uh, uh, Justice Jackson's opinion in Eisentrager when he talks about the idea of empowering our enemies to call our, our commanders accountable. And I think he's exactly right. On Michael's point about terrorists not using drones, God, I love his optimism. But you do not need a 200 pound payload to do damage. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had experience with C4. Uh, it's like a little putty. We used to actually break off pieces and put them on a tank and light it and heat our sea rations on it. You compress it, half a pound of TC4 will blow the hell out of anything near it. We have Claymore mines that are fairly lightweight that fire ball bearings basically uh, out. Uh, the ability to get a small drone that you could literally launch out of a hotel window, you would not have to recover it. You, you, you take it out, you, you fly it above a motorcade, you blow the, uh, you, you fire the explosion, you, you kill a couple of dozen people, uh, and then you let it crash. Uh, and so I just think anybody who thinks that we're not going to face this is, is, is lost touch with reality on that issue. I pray to heck they're right. But remember, the Israelis have been developed. We started developing drones in the 50s. We gave up. The Israelis picked it up. We picked it up from them. Iran has had drones for years. Uh, this, this technology was going forward no matter what we did. It may encourage some people to pursue it further, but you're, he's, he, the point is exactly right. We are going to face a drone threat. We're going to wish drones didn't exist at some point, I fear, because they can fly them right between buildings. Taking them down with something short of a shotgun on the ground is going to be hard. Uh, and uh, it, I, I see it as a very serious problem, but I, I sure hope Michael's right on that. Thank you. We'll take questions. Please identify yourself so that people know who uh, Good afternoon. Um, I'm Chris Cooper. I'm a 3L here at VLS. I want to thank all the panelists for coming and speaking about this issue. I wish we had all day just to talk about this issue because it's, it's that important and there's, there's so many uh, points that probably won't get discussed because of limitations of time. I'm a little amazed at the amount of consensus uh, on this panel. Uh, with perhaps the exception of, of Professor uh, Rona. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I guess I'll direct this question to uh, uh, Professor Turner and maybe um, Mr. Bandau, since they're the ones who spoke directly to it. Professor Turner, began, you began your presentation by asking, you know, are we in a state of war? And talking about, uh, you know, Security Council Resolution, Article 51. And in your, in your comments just now, you referred to, you know, we're in a law of armed conflict setting and making a distinction between that and uh, a law enforcement setting. But I think the better question maybe to ask is, when are we not in a state of war? Would we have been justified prior to 9-11, given the idea of preemptive defense, 
prior to those the UN resolutions being passed, prior to uh, ratification through any kind of congressional resolution, in, in, in acting uh, preemptively. And if, if we act to prevent future attacks, then aren't we always in a state of perpetual war? So I guess my question is, given preemptive defense, is there really any distinction anymore between law that is applicable during war and law that is applicable at any other time? No one on this panel has suggested that we do away with the international law of armed conflict, yet if, the, if uh, that is functionally the outcome of the theory that, that has been proposed, you know, what, why are we making distinctions any longer? Very, very good question. By the way, I check you're not on the list. Uh, <laughs> that, that surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> At least not yet, not yet. <laughs> I had a long email exchange going back at 4.30 of this week with W.A. Parks, who was the top Pentagon expert on law of armed conflict for decades. Uh, he wants to call it law of war. I say law of armed conflict, and the reason is because the law of war uh, came out of a different era where law was a lawful, where war was a lawful op, you know, option for sovereign states. There were no, almost no limits. There were some limits on how you conducted it, but you could go to war for pretty much any reason you wanted. Uh, the, law of, the law of war, said when a war breaks out, everybody else must remain neutral. It was a whole body of neutrality law. Today, under the UN Charter, the ob obligation of all members is to oppose the aggressor. The UN Charter itself is preemptive. The very first article commits members to take effective collective measures to prevent, or sorry, against active threats to the peace. Uh, and so, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I wrote a piece in uh, USA Today, an op-ed back in 98, saying that bin Laden was a lawful target. So the answer is, could we have used drones to kill bin Laden prior to 911? The answer is yes, we could have, but not because we thought he was a bad guy who might someday want to attack us. He was engaged in an ongoing series of armed attacks against us, most specifically, the uh, uh, Tanzania and Kenya embassy bombings the previous month, to my, to my, my piece was written in response to that. Uh, and obviously you have to stand, you know, the, the law of armed conflict you know, does set standards when you can use force. It has to be either defensive or in, you know, pursuant to a Security Council authorization. Uh, there are a few other exceptions. I believe that humanitarian intervention is lawful. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, preemption can be lawful, and if you want a good explanation of that, read John Kennedy's great address uh, uh, announcing the, the embargo against Cuba, uh, who noted that the, the advent of weapons of mass destruction has changed things, and you no longer should have to wait until you've been hit by a nuclear attack before you can defend yourself. But, but there, to me, the, the lines can come close. Law enforcement are in conflict. We are in a hybrid situation where, where both can be done. Under the Third Geneva Convention, it is illegal to try a POW in a domestic court, uh, and it's illegal to hold him in a, in, a, in a penitentiary. He has to be tried in a military court and held in a military detention facility. We are violating that in some cases, and that's pretty much our option because Al-Qaeda does not qualify for the protections of the Third Convention. So we can use law enforcement when we want to, but we can also use law of armed conflict. I agree there's some close cases, but there is a clear distinction, and, and the only time you can use, you know, for, you're in an armed conflict is when you are either have been attacked by an entity or you have very clear evidence they're about to attack you. And, you know, this, you know, most of that evidence is highly classified usually, but, it, but you know, you're, you're, you're raising a good question, but there is a distinction. The two are not interchangeable. Yeah, I think I would look at the distinction between preventative attacks and preemptive attacks. I mean, my view is Iraq was wrong. It was preventive war. We were trying to look into the future, make you know, judgments. What if he possessed this? What might happen, etc. I think very different is if you have, if you're dealing with what appears to be a well-organized group that is hostile to America, that has capability and seems to have intentions to attack us, and it's, you're dealing with a group that hides among the population. It's episodic attacks. I mean. It, it, you have to have some way to respond. It strikes me that I would look for that kind of distinction. I don't think we've had that throughout most of our history. You can argue about exactly why we've had it over the past 20 years, who's responsible, why it's happened. I think we've done a good job in terms of Al-Qaeda, and it's very important to make a distinction between groups that might act that way but are primarily concerned about the Yemeni's government, they're primarily mad at the guys who run Islamabad, and not take on others' people's enemies as our own and turn them into our enemies. 
So there's some very important considerations there that we want to draw this narrowly in terms of the attacks, but I, I make that kind of a distinction. Think of preemptive, where there's a reasonable reason, there's good reason to believe you were going to be attacked. You can preempt that, but you don't do the longer term, well, they may not like us in 10 years from now, maybe they'll develop something. Thank you. Professor Gabor would like to respond. Okay, small point and big point. Small point, Third Geneva Convention doesn't even apply. The reason the Third Geneva Convention doesn't apply is because what it does apply to is wars between states, high contracting parties to the Geneva Conventions. Non-state armed groups don't sign the Geneva Conventions. They're not party to them. They don't get prisoner of war status, so the Third Geneva Convention doesn't even apply to them. Big point, preemptive versus preventive. I spent half my career in, in learning about and applying the, the laws of armed conflict and the laws on the use of force in Europe, and I spent half of my career in, in that realm here in the United States. I gotta tell you, this conversation would not be recognizable outside the United States. And the reason it would not be recognizable is because the US is an incredibly significant outlier from the vast majority of international legal opinion on the question of the propriety of the use of force in international relations. You go back to the Bush um, National Security Doctrine of 2002, which talks about um, preemptive use of force, and you will have seen something that virtually no other state, no court of international stature in the, in the world agrees with. And it is no longer the national security policy. The Obama national security policy very clearly rejected and no longer uses the concept of preemption as a, as, as a source of entitlement for the use of force in international relations. So let's put that one to bed. Just a quick comment, I just, yeah. it's not like John you, you really don't believe, you, you don't mean to be saying the third convention doesn't apply. Certainly common article three does apply and it prevents, it requires that all detainees during any armed conflict be treated humanely. Of course, but not to be tried by military. You agree. That, I agree with that. That was my point, too. Yeah. Professor Stevens, we have about five minutes until lunch. Okay. Well, actually, lunch is served. Okay. So I'm going to suggest that we take the next three questions and, okay. let, and let the panel. Yeah, okay. thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Three questions. We'll get a resting control for me. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much to the panel on Nazmo Dares today. Um, I, I wanted to suggest first, I mean, I think that the excellent question by the colleague from PLS before me illustrates that, you know, Professor Turner, I think that your presentation and your, and your vivid PowerPoint uh, and a lot of the debate on this issue tends to make an appeal to simplicity that I think those of us that work on these issues know just isn't there. I think that if it were the case that it, the clarity of the appeal to LOAC was so convincing, and even that it convinced the many decision makers in government, we wouldn't be having all of these discussions and handering in on questions of target lists and everything else, because of course, as we all know, if it were as simple as an armed conflict that was like many of the historic armed conflicts you had up on the screen, we wouldn't be so troubled with the decision making around targeting and everything else. But I just wanted to actually pose a quick hypo to the panel if I could. I think that oftentimes uh, when we have these examples of whether the terrorists or the Chinese or the Iranians can get drones, we get drawn into the drone aspect of it. And I wanted to pose a hypo that hinges on the legal argumentation of global non-international armed conflict. Um, let's imagine, I think we all can acknowledge there's an armed conflict in Syria going on right now between the government of Assad and the Free Syrian Army and whatever other rebels are fighting. And the United States has clearly said publicly that it is supporting the Free Syrian Army and uh, Kerry, Senator Kerry has said, sorry, Secretary Kerry, has said that he uh, already, that we have authorized over $60 million in support, uh, non-arms, but other goods. So let's imagine three high-level commanders of the FSA travel to the United States to meet with US government uh, representatives near but not inside a school. Uh, and they are clearly high-level commanders, no question that they're in a decision-making capacity. And they're meeting with representatives of the US government to engage in planning. Uh, planning not necessarily immediately for an attack, so the imminence question is not clear, but long-term planning for attacks against the Syrian state. 
Uh, my question is, uh, would the United States government have a legal argument against the Syrian government if Assad were to order two or three Syrian Americans, not with drones or anything fancy like that, but let's say with two car bombs, to attack the FSA <coughs> gentlemen as the targets, but of course taking out not only the U.S. officials they were meeting with, but uh, the U.S. citizens and civilians that were surrounding that meeting. Okay, we're going to take all three questions and then let all the right. panel do with, with them what they will. <laughs> Dean Mahali. Thank you. Um, I, I want to follow up on something Chris said, which really impressed me about autonomous systems. I feel like, in a way, everybody here is taking refuge in the quaintness of the technological present. So I would like to give you a hypothetical jumping forward <laughs> <laughs> uh, as well. Let's jump, let's jump forward. Let's say, we have, because in the educational field, we often have I see again and again new technological systems where people in a sort of self-protective way say, oh, they'll never work. Mm -hmm. You know, MOOCs, massively online, massive online courses won't work because you can never test, but of course there will be tests. Oh, you could never, the, all the things you could never do with automated systems, but they fall one at a time, chess, whatever. So here's the hypothetical. Let's say we're at a point where a machine can in fact find, analyze, and determine the names or the identities of thousands of people associated with uh, an, an organization which has attacked us. And let's say drones aren't from a runway, but let's say they're four inches long and they can fly and there could be thousands of them. And the machine decides where to find these people, how to locate them, it locates them, and it kills them. You could have dozens of them suddenly emerge in this room and take people out. I, let's assume the truth of that. How would you apply ex ante, ex post? How would you apply, how would you apply everything you've been talking about to that present, not to the one where you have almost a quaint system, I mean, just something that would be viewed as quaint, then, where you have a person at a computer screen. Thank you. Our final question. I don't have a hypothetical. I'm <laughs> just a one <laughs> My name is Crystal Abbey, um, and my question is more of a meta question um, for the whole panel. Um, so Norbert Elias, after World War II, uh, discussed the civilizing process, and he talked about how, as societies modernized, uh, citizens yielded their um, they yielded their right to violence to the states. So that way they could uh, use violence against other states to represent their beliefs and issues and concerns. And it seems like as part of this discussion has kind of gone on that the use of drones um, is a way to kind of remove the violence, sort, sort of, um, at least the human element of violence from war. And so I guess my question is, is does that argument, the civilizing process, as a society, as we have these transnational discourses and you know globalizing communications and establishing communities with Twitter and YouTube, with you know people in Syria, um, with, as you know people in America, if that has a place in this discussion, or if that's kind of just subsumed in this argument. Thank you. So keeping in mind that we are keeping people away from food. <laughs> Real quickly on, on Naz's attack, I think it's an illegal attack because you have three Syrians that you're trying to kill and you're taking out a whole school, right? That's not proportional. So, I mean, it would fail the laws of war. Make it proportional. We make it proportional. If, okay, if you make it proportional, then what they have to do before they come on our territory is either get our permission to kill them, and obviously we wouldn't give them that, so then they'd have to say, are you, are you unable or unwilling to stop them, right? And if we say we, and then we are clearly unwilling, we're meeting with them. If we're meeting with them, we're their enemy, right? We are Syria's enemy at this point. If we're Syria's enemy, Syria, Syrian government has the right to do something about that. Now, we can try to stop it. We can try to stop the Syrian assassins, but I, I can't argue with Syria's right to try to take out opposition leaders that are meeting with the U.S., as long as it's proportionate. Let me uh, hit the first question, mea culpa, uh, I, I uh, did simplify. I was testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee a few years ago. <coughs> the staff came to me just before the hearing and said, 
instead of a five minute opening statement, can you keep it to two? I gave my two minutes every, and the chairman said, uh, who was from this, this fine state, uh, don't you think that was a little bit simplistic? Uh, and I said, yes sir, <laughs> trying to, you know, to, to cover that subject in two minutes is by definition, well in the same way I had 12 minutes to cover a lot of material, I apologize, but it, it is true, I did simplify. On the targeting issue, I basically agree. There, there are several issues here. One, they can lawfully attack the people, but just as in our case, if we find Al Qaeda leaders are in the Intercontinental Hotel in Paris, we can't send a cruise missile or, or a drone into France to kill them. There's something called state responsibility. We have, you know, duties to France. Now, if France refuses to give us permission, uh, but continues to allow them to function out of France. Uh, it's a difference, if they go to France to attend a carnival or something, then, you know, they're off limits. But if they are firing missiles out of France or, or planning their war out of France, then we have, France has a state responsibility to us. We can go to them and say, this is what they're doing, stop them, or we may have to exercise our option of self-defense uh, infringing upon your territory, which is well, long recognized as, as a part of our international law. Most of, as I understand it, most of these killings in, uh, in Pakistan and Yemen uh, have been with the consent of the government, but not the public consent. The government doesn't want its radical Islamists to overthrow it, so it will protest to what we do. But uh, just like the uh, recent case in Italy where they sent their CIA director to prison for 20 years, it's fairly clear we had the approval of their government to go in there and, and seize a, uh, uh, an Al-Qaeda terrorist. Uh, we then shipped him off to, uh, I guess, Egypt, where he was tortured, apparently. And I think we should have known he would be tortured there. And that's a violation of international law if you detain someone and then knowingly or willingly put him in the hands of someone uh, either with the knowledge or for the intent of torturing him. Uh, but, but, you know, I don't think it's that hard a case. <coughs> Briefly to the uh, to the dean's question, I I don't have an answer in terms of the the Terminator uh, scenario. But what I think I do know is we are at or quickly will be at a point where machines, autonomous systems, can will be able to take action more quickly, more effectively, more efficiently, more accurately than a human being. And so you will be able to make an argument that it will be more precise and that there will be less collateral damage taking humans out of the decision cycle for the use of lethal force. I think that has staggeringly profound moral and ethical implications that I think we, we need to be discussing because I think, again, I, I think autonomous systems in a sense can and would be more accurate in certain circumstances than than human beings. I'd like to just let me very quickly. I mean, I agree with Michael his analysis on the Syrian question. It strikes me, given limitations of proportionality or other things, the Syrian government could make a good case that it could send in the SWAT team or a SEAL team or it could have send in trained assassins because the U.S. government has demonstrated its unwillingness to turn them over and if they are actually actively engaged, engaged in violent combat against the government, I don't see what legal you know, uh, comment we would have. I think the issue of the autonomous systems, I think there's a real question, what kind of accountability do you have if there's no human decision within the process to use violence? So that's what made me very nervous, is that it may be more precise, but how do you hold, is there, how do you hold anything accountable at that point? The programmer, I mean, that I think is an important issue. The final question I have to admit, I wasn't exactly certain what, where, where it was leading, but you know, we've had kind of these periods of globalization in the past, and that doesn't mean we don't have conflict. I mean, leading up to World War One, trade was increasing on all of the parties, and then they jumped off the precipice into World War One and started slaughtering each other. So, you know, the, the growth of Twitter and social media and these sorts of things doesn't mean we'll have a limitation of conflict, unfortunately. I'm not sure if that answers it, at least. But well, one downside, those of you who are on the list, your iPhone tells them where you are, so it's <laughs> something to think about. Thank you to our panel. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Um,